Giving birth in many parts of Ghana could be a risky affair. In a country where close to 400 deaths are still recorded in every 100,000 live births, giving forth to life could prove a life and death gamble. But even for the people who survive, there could be horrific complications like obstetric fistula. Very little is known about this condition. The patient will be presenting with continuous leakage of urine through their birth canal, through the vagina. As you sit down now, you will be leaking urine continuously, 24 hours, 7 days a week. Morning, afternoon, night, your bed is wet, you never will be dry. Fistula could be one of the worst injuries that could happen to a woman. Victims are forced into hiding because it involves sex, odor, and the private parts of women. So who are these women? Where do they live? What are their stories? And why is Ghana's health insurance scheme failing to pay for the treatment of fistula, a condition that affects the most vulnerable? My name is Justice Beidou, and in this film for Joy News, I'm on the road finding answers to these questions. Inside the local hospital in Boko, a cesarean session on a woman in desperate need this hospital is located in one of the poorest parts of Ghana. A few years ago, such a surgery could not have been done here because the human resource and infrastructure to do it could not be found in such a remote location. Now, this is possible in faraway Boko, on the northeastern tip of Ghana's border with Burkina Faso. It goes to show how far the country's health care delivery has come. Dr. Clement Opon, an example of a dedicated health workforce offering his expertise where many his like would hardly go. Here, he makes more than three surgeries every day. There are about three um, districts surrounding this, um, this municipality that does not have um, hospitals. hospitals. So this serves as a, the main referral point for all maternal cases from these three regions. And sometimes we also get um, cases from the Boko West District, which is the Zevila area. So this is the main referral center for the communities or the district on the eastern part of the Upper East Region. We get a lot of referrals from these areas and um, we are trying our best to cope with the pressure that come with us. So the, we don't have adequate hands on the ground. The doctors are very few because most of the doctors don't accept postings here. So Upper East has a high population of uh, teenage pregnancies. Okay, I think somewhere in the other parts of the country, teenage pregnancies is seen like a child who has gone to do something. But here, these are married, wedded young girls who require babies okay in my consulting room i treat patients who are as young as 17 18 and are still treating infertility looking for babies and once these babies these uh, patients are very young and they are carrying babies labor and delivery is likely to be difficult normally the patient want to call the fistula survivors because there are two categories of people who suffer from delayed delivery the first group die and those who survive are the, those who actually get the fistula. So we normally tell them that they are fistula survivors. We are increasingly seeing increasing numbers of um, fistula cases when we started this. The unfortunate thing about fistula cases is that you don't expect the fistula patients to pick his bag and come to hospital. They will not do so because of the stigma attached to the disease, because they are leaking urine, they are leaking feces, they are smelling. 
their social life is lost. They cannot go to church. They cannot go to the mosque. They cannot go to the market. They can't even join public transport with the purpose of coming to hospital. This region already has one of the worst records of maternal mortality. Birth rates are high, many unsupervised. And for some of the women lucky to deliver alive, complications like obstetric fistula occur. At the OPD, some of the women who live with the horrors of fistula have come for their routine checkup. Hawa Halidu, married at 13. Zainabu Abdullahi, married at 14. Shehu Lar, married at 15. And the list goes on and on. They are comforted by Cynthia Sinawisi, herself a survivor of fistula, helping other victims to come out. I lived with it for two years, two months. Tell me how it was like for you. It was like hell. One, you can't sleep well in the night, you can't sleep well. Because when you sleep, you will by all means be wet. You have to get up and change. You can't go anywhere. You can't mix. You can't be with your friends and a whole lot. The only thing you can do is to be in the house. There are times when you even go to fetch water in the Google and there are people are there. Because of the urine scent, they will, they will start moving one by one. The Kolebu Teaching Hospital is Ghana's largest health center. I'm here to meet Professor Anyate Lase, who has been operating fistula patients for the last 20 years. Hello, Prof. Hello. Good evening. Yeah. An obstetric fistula is uh, an abnormal hole that develops just between the birth canal, which we ca call vagina, and the bladder where urine accumulates before the voiding sensation and you go and void. These are examples of fistula. This baby's head is jammed. It's been jammed between the backbone of the mother and the pubic bone that is in front. And over a long period of time, uh, the baby tends to die, the head will collapse, it gets smaller, and then the mother with a small pelvis is able to expel the fetus. But that is not without severe significant damage to the uh, birth canal. A hole develops and you start leaking urine and all phases. The secrecy surrounding fistula and the shame linked to it means no one knows an accurate number of people currently living with the condition. But in 2015, the Ghana Health Service reported almost 1,300 cases are estimated to occur annually. Nationally, only 200 are repaired, leaving more than 1,000 victims behind every year. To us in matters, Ghana's health insurance scheme doesn't pay for its repair. This is, this is a condition that is not catered for by our health insurance no. um, scheme. No. How problematic is that? Because this condition affects the poorest of women in the most vulnerable of places. Yes. What, what does that mean? Apart from the problem of uh, ensuring that we prevent new cases from developing, we've got the backlog of cases out there in the community to, to repair restore some dignity to these women. Now, by way of cure, you need to have an operation. And the operation often requires being given an injection at your back to freeze the lower end of your body, and the operation can be done through the birth canal. You, don't, you may not have any cut at all in the tummy. 
Now, by way of cost, it costs between two and four hundred US dollars to get a, the fistula fix. It may be less, it may be more, depending on how very bad the injury is. Many of these women are rural women uh, involved in subsistence farming uh, and being pushed to the periphery. Many of them may not even have the subsistence farming to do. Stories of women marrying at tender ages is common here, as it is in many parts of Ghana. Access to family planning still faces big hurdles in parts of the country. And so in places like this, women really do not have control over how many children they want to have and at what age. Cynthia has brought us to the outskirts of Garu to meet someone living with fistula. It's about an hour drive from Boko. Farming is the economic lifeblood here. And with rains lasting for less than five months every year, poverty and malnutrition levels are high. The women bear the most brunt. I've come here to meet Mampoak Yaru. She's been living with fistula for more than 20 years. Mampuak's mother betrothed her to a man that she herself had refused marriage to. The man already had eight wives. She's not sure what age she was then, but says her breasts had just developed then, possibly meaning she would have been in her early teens. She had her first four deliveries unsupervised at home. It was her faith that got complicated. And when she couldn't reach a professional birth attendant after 24 hours in labor, she lost her child. When I was young, we used to marry as soon as our breasts developed. So I don't remember my age, but I moved to a man's house as soon as my breasts started developing. Mampuak's story may have been years ago, and even though early marriages have largely reduced in Ghana since she had her fistula in 1997, the practice is still high here. So how long did it take you to get to the hospital when you, you got into labor? I was in labor for two days and I had to struggle to give birth in my hand. In this town, if you go into labor and you're not able to deliver on your own at home, they say you are not woman enough. My mother was supposed to marry my husband. She didn't love him, so she married another man. On a day, ma. Then she gave me to that man instead and married against my will. <laughs> so what happens to a lot of the women who um, are living with fistula in this community? No one helps you, so I only farm to eat. To understand how deeply rooted the problems that cause fistula are, we are going to another region where maternal health has been terribly bad in the past. 
the Upper West Region. It is nearly 300 kilometers traveling from Boko to Wa, the Upper West Regional Capital. More than half of that road is untarred. The community we are going to is called Duduma, in the Wa West District, about 50 extra kilometers. So if we push up, okay. Okay. As we get close, the road gets so bad we need to get onto one of these tricycles to be able to go to Dodoma. Bad roads is one of the many reasons pregnant women in this part of Ghana cannot access health care in time. We've come here to meet some of the women who have chilling stories about how their labor got delayed and complicated because they couldn't make it to a health center. People here have lost count of the numbers that have died giving birth. It's the peak of the rainy season and every hand is needed on the farm. But these villagers have sacrificed time to meet us to talk about their problems. Here, dancing is the best way to say welcome. <laughs> Nearly every woman here knows what it feels to have an obstructed labor. As we sit, they line up to bear it all. This woman is not sure of her age but thinks she could be 50. She's had nine children. Four of them died because she couldn't get to a health center in time. Her baby came out of her womb while she was still on a motorbike heading to a health center. The morning I went into labor, I was sitting in the sun. I was only looking up to God. They had to look for a motorbike to take me to the hospital, but there was no motorbike in this village. When we got the motorbike from the next town, there was no fuel. Somebody had to extract fuel from his motorbike. When I sat on the motorbike for some minutes, I could not stand the pains again. My first baby came out whilst I was still on the motorbike, trying to get to the clinic. And I had to get off the motorbike. So they brought me back to deliver the second. Take the story of Ya Pensua, for example. She had to make a journey of more than 50 kilometers because the district hospital closest to her had no blood when she needed it while in labor. She lost her baby on arrival and is not sure what complications she has now. I was in Boja Cassiani two fees, I know, or two seeing nine were fear, and Sanna McCall one. The maker picked Yanim in the call, daughter, and back at Yanim and say, There's a chip's compound six kilometers away. But when we go, there are no nurses there. We walk there and find that the facility is empty. So that is why we go to the district hospital. Even if you send the patients there, you won't find anybody there. There's nobody there. It's an empty facility. I bled for four days. There was no health facility close. And when I finally got to the hospital, my baby had died. If I had given birth, it definitely would have been a human being. So I would have been happy to have him, but he died, so there's nothing I can do. As we listen to these women one after the other, what strikes me is that most of these cases go unreported. 
And as delivery complications as these persist, dangerous conditions like fistula would continue. Hello, Justice joining us. Thank you. The next morning, we visit the Taliwana Chips Compound. It's the closest health facility to Dodoma. These small health facilities are one of the many ways the government of Ghana plans to bring health care closer to the people. But there are basic challenges here that means they could hardly make any difference. This is the Talawana Chips compound. It's just about six miles away from Dodoma. It's supposed to be the first point of call for pregnant women who are in need of first aid. Government has recently built hundreds of such structures across many remote areas in Ghana. The problem though is that there are usually not enough health workers to work in them or even in instances where there are, they usually do not have the needed facilities or even medicines to work with. The government wants to build 1,600 of these facilities over the next four years to improve maternal health. But that too has its own challenges. Most of them too, if you ask, they said from their place coming here sometimes it's tiring. So mostly I follow them up to give service to them. Because the motor is not strong, sometimes I got locked up on the way, flat tire or something. We are back in a car. The high-rise buildings and the fast-moving traffic here looks a world away from the dusty roads and touch-roofed homes in the villages of Garu and Dodoma. In some ways, it shows the widening gap of inequality in the Ghanaian society. This is where government bureaucracy is. And here, I want to find some answers. Much of the cost for all fistula surgeries are paid for by charity, mainly from the UN Population Fund. The fund is now facing budget cuts. This means the fate of the rest of the women on the waiting list for fistula surgeries hang in the balance. Most often times these women, they're not aware that treatment is available, so they stay in their communities and suffer for years. Uh, we've met women who have had this condition over 10 years um, and, or more. Um, so the issue around creation, we, uh, awareness creation, has to be increased. So number one, we have already seen that there's a huge gap in that. Um, and also in terms of the treatment, um, we only have a few doctors that are trained, so we have to increase the, the number of doctors that can provide the treatment. Um, that is very key to ensuring that we can able to address the backlog that exists. As a part of our maternal health program, as I mentioned, obstetric fistula is a key component. So whether our funds is small or big, it will always be a key priority that we're going to focus on. But recognizing, as you mentioned, the dwindling resources you know, that is happening globally, it affects the amount of resources we have to actually contribute to this program. The story of fistula victims goes to show how healthcare delivery in Ghana marginalizes the poor and most vulnerable. In 2014, when the right campaign group Send Ghana did a study, it found out many women, even those who are registered on the scheme, stay away from antenatal care because of unapproved charges. In terms of pregnant women, even though the scheme makes it um, once you register and once you are pregnant, you are not supposed to pay anything. What we found out was that there were certain illegal charges that um, hospitals were taking from pregnant, well, I mean, pregnant women or women who went to deliver, uh, you know, their babies, because they were being charged certain illegal fees. Some found it um, useful not to attend or not to even use supervised delivery, and so they would rather have themselves attended to by a traditional birth attendant. It's not just about avoiding the most expensive disease to treat, but it's about providing the 
the cushion, the financial cushion, so as to get the scheme serve the purpose of removing financial barriers. And if we are not doing that, we may succeed in enrolling people for the purpose of treating uh, malaria and other common diseases. But there are other forms of diseases that are killing people and are killing them because they do not have the financial means. If a social intervention as good as the National Health Insurance will not be responsive to the needs of poor women who suffer these conditions, then we are not addressing, we are not using a good program to address um, a critical need. Even if it doesn't kill women immediately, the humiliation, the stigmatization, and the um, you know, seclusion that they suffer from society is too much to bear. And no human being and no uh, woman should be allowed to go through that condition simply because they do not have the resources. To wrap up this film, I've come back to Boko to meet some of the fistula survivors again. If we want to care fistula in this area, that we have to change the mindset of the whole population as far as girls' empowerment is concerned. Girls have to take a decision when they have to marry or when, when they don't want to marry. And here, it is a choice that has to be made between a husband, uh, a would-be husband, and the parents. And the girl has no choice at all that to go into the marriage. And usually, the reason is for financial reasons. A backlog of at least 13,000 women are waiting. Waiting that some way, somehow, help would reach them to have their surgeries soon. How long they would have to wait, nobody knows. For Hotline, my name is Justice Bader.